tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's October 2021, and this is episode 259, which is a spoiler-filled conversation about the James Bond film, No Time to Die. On this episode, I'm joined by Cole Burgett, who is a recent seminary graduate and a graduate of the Moody Bible Institute, as well as an author for the website Christ in Pop Culture. Cole has written an online exclusive film review of No Time to Die, and it's called All the Time in the World, No Time to Die, and the End of an Era. You can access his article to read it for free on our website, equip.org, if you are a subscriber to our journal. If you are not a subscriber to our journal, please subscribe at our website, equip.org, to get access to this exclusive content. Cole, it's good to have you on. Always good to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Well, today we're talking about the last film in the James Bond series that stars actor Daniel Craig as 007. And it's been quite a long time for all of these films to unfold. It's been 15 years. And... I think most of us have some inkling of James Bond, whether it's, you know, some of the iconic actors like Sean Connery or Roger Moore. But this series of films that Daniel Craig was in just had like a little bit of a different tone. And we just want to talk about James Bond a little bit. And I also want to mention to you that Cole has an upcoming feature article about the novels by Ian Fleming about James Bond coming up in our print edition that you don't want to miss. So I know that this Bond series of films is very special for you. So could you talk a little bit about your familiarity with the series and what it means to you in particular? Uh, sure. Uh, so the, the Bond series has always been my, uh, my first love of sorts when it comes to fandoms or whatever you want to call it. Uh, my late uh, aunt is actually the lady I credit with getting me into the series. I, I vividly remember her watching Dr. No, the, uh, the original 1962 film featuring Sean Connery um, as, as this young kid. And I was completely captivated by it. Look, I was, I was a very independent child. <laughs> I, I needed a lot more supervision than I received um, because Bond is not what I would call a good role model. Uh, but even, even as a kid, I recognized that Bond was a, uh, it was a fantasy. It was a high adventure. And I honestly have approached Bond for as, as long as I can remember with all the reverence and appreciation you find for series like you know, Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings. The difference is the Bond fantasy uh, is the one that Ian Fleming originally created in his novels. And I describe it as this modern phantasmagoria world that looks almost exactly like our own. It's just set five minutes in the future with slightly advanced technology. So it's not some ancient past or galaxy far, far away. It's it's now, just five minutes from now. Um, and there are these you know distinct archetypes in the world of Bond, particular beats in the narrative that really lends itself uh, the feel of being a genre to itself. Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, the guys who have written a good number of the more recent Bond films, describe Bond as a genre. And, and they're right. It, Star Wars is a space opera, but it's really its own genre. There are distinctly Star Wars elements that you will find nowhere else. Well, Bond is the exact same way. It's an action thriller series, but at the end of the day, it's its own genre. And, you know, I think genre studies are important. Fantasies are important. Mythologies are important. And for what you call a collective imagination. And so Bond was the fantasy that really caught me first and has held me for the longest. I love Star Wars. I love The Lord of the Rings. But personally, Bond is always my first and greatest. Do you think that these Bond series of films for the 21st century is a little bit old fashioned? I mean, it's kind of like there are good guys and bad guys, and it seems like in cinema and in pop culture as of late, all of those lines are blurred a little bit more than, oh, we're going to root for 007 because he's a good guy. Yeah, it certainly comes across that way, right? But that, that's certainly why I uh, I like it. Uh, Skyfall, the, the more recent film with Daniel Craig, basically, even it's, it's a little what the kids call meta these days. 
because it basically takes that question you just asked and and frames it within the context of the film's narrative. And it it really is this great apology in, in the sense of, you know, argument. It's this great apology case being made for why Bond is still relevant in the, in the modern era. These all certain, there are certain old fashioned sensibilities uh, that are never going to go out of style. Good guys are good. Bad guys are bad. And, and there has to be some type of figure to stand in the gap. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it certainly is, I guess, a little what you call outdated by a lot of modern pop culture standards. Uh, but in a lot of ways, that's its appeal. And it's even reflected in the the way that uh, the producers and the crew make these films. They are sort of legendarily limited with CGI, especially the more recent Craig films. It, when they do stunts, they are practical stunts uh, as much as they can get away with. So it feels very real and there's not a lot of computer generated stuff, which you know is, is a thousand miles and poles apart from something like what Marvel does. Um, and they do it very well. You, it's hard to tell the CGI, but so much of it is CGI, green screen, things like that. And what, what the Bond films do is, is just very distinct and old fashioned. It's classic cinema. It really is a classic movie going experience. And, and that's part of its appeal for me, at least. I mentioned that Cole has written a article for our print edition about Ian Fleming's original novel. So how do you think that the novels compare to the films of James Bond? Mm, good question. Uh, let's see. I discovered Fleming's original novel somewhere around middle school going into high school. Again, I, I needed much more supervision than I received. Uh, and I, I read them in order, and I've read some more than others. I've read Casino Royale three or four times, and I've read several Fleming short stories. He has a couple of books of short stories, and maybe six or seven times. As far as how they compare to the films, the novels really are their own thing. And I have to be careful because I could talk about this for like days. And what I mean by that is they're a, they're a product of their time and the man who wrote them. There's a really wonderful documentary out called Everything or Nothing. I think that it was uh, released back in 2012 for the 50th anniversary alongside Skyfall. I encourage anyone interested in the history of the Bond series to watch that documentary. It does a very good job of tracing the story from Fleming's background in World War II to the modern era of the, the Craig films. Fleming very much put himself and his world and in some ways his views of the world on the page through the character of James Bond. So that's the first really significant way in which they are different from the films. Uh, John Pearson, who is Fleming's biographer, says in this documentary, very simply, he says Bond was Ian. In other words, Bond was Fleming's alter ego, in a sense. The, the films, on the other hand, started with producers Harry Saltzman and Albert Broccoli, known as uh, Cubby Broccoli. And the Broccoli family still owns the rights to the character. His daughter, Barbara, and his stepson, Michael G. Wilson, are the producers of the film series now. So it's a family affair. So what I like to say is in the novels, you get Fleming's bond. On film, you get the producer's bond. Now, obviously, there's a conversation between the two, but the way that Fleming writes bond is very distinct. Uh, in The Spy Who Loved Me, which is a very unconventional novel, if you don't know the novels because it, bond is barely in it. It's, it's really written from the perspective of a woman, and it has nothing to do with the movie. In that novel, Fleming describes Bond as a man with years of dirty, dangerous memories, uh, which is a very, very distinct description. Bond is a figure who has a lot of self-hatred in the books. He despises his, his profession. He hates what he does, even though he's very good at it. You see a little bit of that in Timothy Dalton's portrayal. He, Timothy Dalton has some very good lines uh, that sort of echo straight out of Fleming. Bond, as Fleming wrote him, is a man who is always on the edge of his humanity. He's deeply introspective, he's strongly opinionated, and he's really a psychological head case in some ways. And the film series got away from that. You see glimpses of it with Connery, that's Sean Connery, whose portrayal had a, a great influence on Fleming in his later works. Fleming sort of was a little apprehensive about Connery's casting. He didn't look the way Fleming envisioned Bond, but then after Fleming saw Connery work in Dr. No, it re really, he changed a lot of the character to fit Connery. By the time of George Lazenby and Roger Moore, that the next two actors, Fleming's Bond is all but gone. You know, the films portray him as this kind of unflappable sort of witty hero. 
Timothy Dalton, uh, who comes next, as I mentioned, is very good at matching his portrayal with Fleming's Bond and Pierce Brosnan, the 90s Bond that I grew up with. That was the Bond that I sort of knew for the longest time. He became this sort of apex hero type, sort of the pinnacle of what you think of when you think of Bond as like a superhero. But then Daniel Craig really reinvented the character and brought it back into line with something very close to Fleming. So in broad strokes, I would say that the conversation between the books and the film series is something that is always ongoing. Uh, They're always pulling things from the books. The films are always finding little ways to reference facets from the books. And uh, it's just been that way for, for 60 years. So when we think about James Bond, I think most times we think of how he's been portrayed in the past as kind of like this womanizing you know, scotch on the rocks, drinker, and just uh, someone who doesn't have any kind of stability. He just, you know, likes fast cars and he's has this dangerous uh, job about him. So it seems like he'd be something of a controversial figure for Christians in particular. So is there anything that Bond even has to offer for Christians? I mean, should Christians even pay attention to the Bond films? And if they have, What is a reason why they could even watch one of these films? I think you alluded to the fact that, you know, you were introduced to them and maybe it wasn't appropriate fair for you. So is it something that Christians should even consider? Yeah, this is a a great question. And to to sort of wade into the Bond controversy, because he really has been a controversial figure for all the reasons you've mentioned and more. Honestly, this is part of why I like the character and why I like these movies, because they, they really are this series that morphs through time and is sort of ageless in how it can move Bond through different eras. And everybody always tends to think that uh, the era that they're in is the era where Bond dies. I mean, everybody thought Bond was going to die when the Cold War ended. Uh, And then you've got Pierce Brosnan, who came back and completely reinvented the character for a post-Cold War era. And his first couple of films did fantastic at that. And people were like, oh, okay, he'll survive. And then, you know, 9-11 9-11 happens, Die Another Day comes out, everybody kind of is like, it was this sort of dumb. And then, you know, okay, Bond's dead. Well, then Daniel Craig comes back and he completely reinvents it for a, a, a post-9-11, more cynical era. So it, it's just the way these movies go. They're, they're sort of timeless in that way. But he has always flirted with controversy. And what I want to go back to for why Christians should begin to pay attention to Bond is I want to point out that the controversy started before Bond ever became the screen sensation that he did, it started with Fleming. When I was in seminary, in one of my capstone theology courses, I was able to do an entire lecture on Bond, on this topic specifically, and I'm very indebted to the professor who allowed me to do that. Fleming described himself in a letter once as some kind of subspecies as Christian. That's a direct quote. He actually wrote this letter to a reverend named Leslie Paxton, Fleming had heard that Paxton had preached a sermon condemning the character of Bond. And Fleming wrote this letter out of concern for how Bond was being construed by the larger culture. A lot of people see the Bond films as endorsing what Bond does or what Fleming writing as endorsing what Bond does. And that's not necessarily the case, because if you just follow the narrative, especially in Craig's films and especially in some of Fleming's later novels, you see that the lifestyle Bond leads doesn't take him where you want to end up. The narrative itself shows that it's not quite an endorsement of what Bond is doing. It's dealing with a man who does those things. Uh, and, and I think Fleming was, was very conscientious of, of that fact. Anne Boyd, uh, she was an early Bond critic. She reports that Fleming was known to go out and about in London looking for the oldest churches he could find and just sort of sit in them. So the, the way I've described Fleming, and I took a cue from the writer Flannery O'Connor, she once described the American South as being Christ-haunted, to mean uh, there are traces of Christ, but only a residual trace like a ghost that lingers. And that's a description that as a Southerner, I can tell you is extremely accurate. I've always loved that description. So I took it and applied it to Fleming. Fleming is someone who was haunted by goodness. I mean, the man smoked dozens and dozens of cigarettes per day. He died very young. He was only 56. He drank himself away. He was married to a very popular socialite named Anne, but he had this very intense affair with Blanche Blackwell, the Jamaican heiress. Uh, So he lived this very promiscuous life. And I always get a kick out of these, like, (laughs) you know, Christian snobs who thumb their nose and say that Fleming could never understand anything about Christianity. 
because then I just look at them and say one word, acedia. And of course they blink and, you know, scratch their heads because they've never heard of it. And I proceed to tell them it's all over Fleming's books. And now acedia is a word that is not common in this culture. The closest conception we have of it is something like apathy. And it's a very stripped down idea of what acedia is. Acedia is a, it's very much an ancient notion that Christians, early Christians were very concerned about, and it was considered a sin. Early monastics in the church, uh, Vagrius of Pontus and John Cassian, believed it to be this like particularly nasty sin. Thomas Aquinas, the well-known medieval theologian, he framed it as one of the deadly sins, and today we call it sloth, or again, apathy. But that really waters it down. The concept of acedia has a spiritual dimension. It's a kind of spiritual apathy. It's been called uh, the noonday devil. It's the devil that rears its head in the daylight hours around midday when the day becomes long and laziness sets in. It's a kind of carelessness with one's spiritual well-being that leads one to spiritual torpor. And in turn, that leads one to indifference or, or then what we might call apathy. So it's not quite apathy. That's sort of like the end product. In other words, acedia is the thing that flares up when you know what is right and good, but you come to hate doing what is right and good in the first place. It's a very, very complex notion that Christians today have completely jettisoned. Uh, you don't find this word circling around in, in you know, common Christian conversations today. The great irony there is that acedia is, is quite literally the thing that keeps you like laying in bed, staring at Facebook, endlessly scrolling without ever actually paying attention. And people say to me, oh, you mean Fleming wrote about that? Oh, he didn't just write about it. He wrote against it. Acedia is, in Fleming's novels, the ultimate Bond villain. Long, villainous monologues that people make fun of the movies for. Fleming's villains use these as confessions. Blofeld, the big villain, Mr. Big and Live and Let Die, they talk about Acedia. And they talk about it as this ancient Christian notion. In Casino Royale, he Bond even ponders the role that Acedia plays when like relationships break down, which is a hugely philosophical section of the book that has very keen insights that blow right over our heads today. So yeah, yeah, I, I do think Fleming actually is interested in a very Christian conversation that not even Christians have been involved in for a century or more. And to bring this back around to the films and why Christians should pay attention to them, Daniel Craig's 15-year, five-movie stint as Bond has done a lot to rediscover the psychology of Fleming's Bond. Now, Acedia isn't named specifically, but the residual traces of that sin is felt in Craig's Bond films especially. So all that to say, yes, I think Christians absolutely should pay attention to the Bond series. It is one that we far too quickly handed over to the culture because it was risque and seemed not entirely conservative when it first came out, which is absolutely hilarious to me in hindsight because now it's one of the most conservative franchises around. I mean, we literally just talked about it being so old-fashioned. It's why Barbara Broccoli and Michael Wilson are, for my money, two of the best producers working in the world today because they refuse to compromise. They don't bend the knee to the whims of the culture. Barbara has consistently denied that she will ever make Bond a woman. Michael has said time and again that they're not going to chase the Marvel approach and do all of these spinoffs and any of that nonsense. So if, if you're not sold on the Acedia angle, you know, care about the Bond series because it's an old soul <laughs> that believes in old-fashioned movie making and the magic of the theater-going experience, which in a world of, of streaming is, is quickly falling by the wayside. So if I can't convince you to care about Bond because of Acedia, try, try the, the old-style movie making angle. <laughs> You're listening to episode 259 of the Postmodern Realities podcast brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest, Cole Burgett, has written an online exclusive film review of the latest James Bond film. His review is called All the Time in the World, No Time to Die, and The End of an Era. And our subscribers can access it for free on our website, equip.org. Now, if you're not already a subscriber for $33.50, not only do you get our print edition in the mail to you, but you also get online access to dozens of articles that we publish every year that are only at equip.org for our subscribers to read. And another way you could be helping us out if a subscription is not in your budget right now would be to leave us a tip. To do that, it's really easy. You just go to equip.org. You go to magazine at the drop down. You'll see Postmodern Realities Podcast. If you go to any of the landing pages for any of the episodes, you will be able to find a link where you could give us a small tip like $3 or $5 or $10. And 
all of that adds up and it does help you produce this content because it helps us make our budget to help remunerate our great writers. And we think their content is worth paying for all the time that they invest research or watch films or television series so that we can help you as a Christian apologist be equipped to know how to interact with that content as you share the gospel with your friends and family. In addition, one way you can help us that's completely free is to tell a friend about this podcast. Simply link to this podcast or your favorite episodes on your social media feeds or just tell a friend just in person about it. In addition, you can be entered to win a free subscription to the Christian Research Journal if you give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. The way you can be entered into the contest is to actually write a short written review of one or two sentences about why you like to listen to this podcast. And anyone who's done so after July 1st of 2021 will be entered into the contest. And at the end of the year, we will announce the winner. And the odds are really good for you right now because so far we have very few entries. So please help us out and put a rating or review up there. And thank you for the ways in which you support this podcast. We are grateful. We were talking about how No Time to Die is the end of an era for Daniel Craig over the last 15 years. And you were just talking about the producers of this series of films. And actually, you know, you mentioned Dr. No. That was the very first Bond film, and that was almost 60 years ago. So it has definitely um, been had quite the longevity in terms of filmmaking for a specific series. And so, and of course, this is Daniel Craig's last run as 007. So in the review that you've written for us, you talk about the importance of myth to this particular Bond story. And so can you unpack that for us? What role does myth play in this film, No Time to Die? Myth is is all over this movie. In a way that it hasn't always been in in other films, you mentioned the longevity of the the series, and and it's you're very right about this. Um, Bond is, you know, arguably the most prestigious film series in in cinema history. You, you're you're never going to be able to do a history of cinema without touching at some point on James Bond. It's it's just not going to happen. Um, the only one that comes close is Godzilla. To bring this this conversation into the realm of myth. Myth is all over No Time to Die. And, and I mentioned that the Bond series is a, a kind of genre unto itself. It's, it has its own kind of mythology that every you know different interpretation of Bond adheres to. Uh, Connery, Moore, you know, on and on it goes. But No Time to Die really reaches out and pulls in some interesting mythological beats. And there will be some spoilers here. Uh, but the, the bioweapon that Bond has to go after... Uh, which is you know very modern sort of you know techy, but the bioweapon that Bond has to go after is called Heracles, for example. Uh, now, in the ancient Greek myth, uh, you know this is the thing that Disney doesn't show you in Hercules, uh, but Heracles <laughs> in the ancient myth dies when he's given this poison tunic, and he chooses to incinerate himself rather than, than live in pain and isolation from, from his loved ones. Now, if you've seen No Time to Die, and, and you should, by the way, it's a good film, Bond is himself poisoned by the Heracles bioweapon. You know that the film ends with him talking to his family as these missiles are, are falling toward him and he dies by incineration. So the parallels are there. The mythological parallels are there, very pronounced. There's also the scene where, where Spectre, the great villainous organization that Bond always battles, is having a meeting, and Blofeld describes them. He's sort of, it's that classic, you know, the voiceover, Bond villain voiceover scene where Blofeld is just sort of talking into the, the ether, as it were. But Blofeld describes them as the gods of Olympus returning from their exile. Uh, and when you watch the opening credits, there are all these ancient Grecian statues and symbols like the trident, which also comes back in the film. Bond is personified on Q's little gadget screen as a, as a trident. He actually calls him a trident. Um, so, so Greek mythology especially is all over this film. And it really elevates the storytelling. It's Bond elevated from the level of fantasy and brought into the realm of myth, which C.S. Lewis will argue contains very important truths. Myth, myth is what won Lewis to Christianity. 
So when we see Bond at the end willing to sacrifice himself to save the world and you know, he's doing it selflessly and not out of some motivation for revenge, which early in Craig's run is the thing that really drove him. It's a very profound character change. And even though I I really don't like to use this expression, it's very Christ-like. And that resonates with people. In the review I wrote, I described No Time to Die as Bond's odyssey. In, In Homer's poem, Odysseus just wants to get home to his family. And that's really what Bond's story becomes by the end of the movie. It's Bond just trying to get back to his family, but of course he, he doesn't make it. And that's, that's a very mature storytelling choice because it casts Bond as a tragic hero. This is not the Disney-fied version of life. Bond has never been a happily ever after figure. Bond surrenders himself to goodness, finally, after like 60 years. He surrenders himself to goodness, but only in the final moments of his life. You, you know, had he just made different choices had he trusted more, he could have had that family. It wouldn't be ending this way, but it does. And there are serious lessons to be to be learned there. So you're saying that um, Bond can be a type of anti-hero, but how does this film in particular, No Time to Die, bring him full circle? How does it complete his arc? I mean, what moves him into tragic hero territory in his last moments. And also, why do you think people, you know, we talked about this being kind of old fashioned. Why why do you think people continue to respond to the character of James Bond over these 60 years, particularly in the films I'm talking about? I mean, do you think it's because he's a type of anti-hero? Yeah. Yeah. uh, Let me, let me pick through this for just a second. Yeah. The the, the modern era is is obsessed with anti-heroes and we've talked about this in some other interviews. Batman is the other big one. And interestingly, this age of reboots and reimaginings that we're currently in started with Bond and Batman. Casino Royale and Batman Begins came out within a year of each other. Uh, The word reboot still meant something that you did to a computer uh, when the two teams were working on those films. And after 2005 and 2006, everything started getting rebooted. But I think it's because, you know, again, Bond, like Batman, is his own genre. You know, there are just certain things you expect, hidden layers, larger-than-life villains, exotic locations, some cool technology. You know, there are indicators. When you, you have a larger-than-life villain and a hidden layer in another movie, you don't go, oh, that's very action thrillery. You go, oh, that's very Bond-like. That kind of thing is embedded in the public conscious. So I think people keep coming back to it because it's familiar, but also because Bond is very human. He's not a superhero. He's an ordinary man with a really cool job. I listened to an interview with Barbara Broccoli for No Time to Die, and and she made this very point. And she said something to the effect of the heroic will never go out of style, like the old-fashioned hero will never go out of style. And she's right. People go back to Bond for the same reasons we keep on going back to uh, like Heracles and Odysseus. And it's why people still respond to Star Wars. It's defining a modern mythology, and people will always respond to that. Now, you, you also brought up No Time to Die and how it completes. And I, I mean, this, this, really, this really does have, have to do with, with pulling, pulling Bond out of the anti-hero realm and putting him into tragic hero territory. And I'm glad that Barbara Broccoli and Michael Wilson had the, the strengths of ego to end Craig's run, this particular uh, iteration of the series, where they did it. They had the ability to see that Craig needed a definitive period at the end of his sentence because his films have been so interconnected and his bond has had a very distinct arc. It needed to end and it did. And they ended it well and in a way that says some pretty profound things because Bond is an anti-hero at the end of the day. And Craig's run specifically has been about moving him out of that territory. There are some, some pretty clear specific ways this happens where you you see his his betrayal with with vesper and casino royale um and it, it sort of plunges him into this sort of darkness that from quantum of solace onward he is coming out of in 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 little spurts and there are things that happen that break him open uh the death of M in skyfall the returning to his childhood home and as, as much as people did not particularly like how they handled uh, Blofeld and Spectre, for what they were doing with Craig's run with the character, Blofeld played a very specific role in bringing Bond further out of out of that darkness by having him grapple with his, his past and, and doing a lot of like hard psychology work. 
having Bond experience a family in No Time to Die, which comes sort of very unexpectedly, uh, is huge. And and the, the key moment in No Time to Die for Bond is, is when he can finally a- admit where he's gone wrong. There are two things in No Time to Die I want to talk about that are very telling along these lines because I think they really are brilliant. This is how you know that Craig's films understand Fleming's Bond. Because the thing that Craig did with the character 15 years ago was to begin humanizing him. He gave us a very sensitive, fragile man who was also very dangerous. He bled and you believed he could be hurt, and he made Bond vulnerable. The completion of that arc, the most vulnerable thing, is to have Bond die. So narratively, it it, it works. It, it brings him through. But there are two key facets of his psychology I want to hone in on. You know, this is all separate from Spectre, which has a, a bunch of really interesting little tidbits in there. No Time to Die begins with uh, Madeline telling Bond that in order for them to have a future, he has to let go of Vesper because that has been what's been driving him for the past, since, since the beginning. So notice she says that uh, he has to forgive her. That's what he has to do. But when he goes to her grave, if you remember this, you know, the, he's following that folklore tradition in Matera where he writes his secret on the piece of paper and then burns it. Well, when he goes to her grave, Madeline tells him he has to go there to forgive her. But when he goes to the grave, if you remember what it says, the paper says, forgive me. And that's Bond's darkness. That's the burden Bond carries. He blames himself and he hates himself. And if he had just been better, if he had just seen what was coming, maybe he could have saved Vesper. That's the psychology of his character that Fleming really gets that people tend to miss for whatever reason. He goes there, Madeline says, forgive her, but when he shows up, the paper says, forgive me, and he burns it. And the the completion of his character arc is after he throws Madeline away, after he thinks she's betrayed him, on very slim reasoning, he immediately jumps to the conclusion, you're just another Vesper, and he sends her off. Uh, When he finally catches up with her in Norway, when he goes back to her family home, and he has that conversation with her, and he tells her when he sees her, I came here, basically he says, I came here for the job. I came here to find out who gave you the poison, blah, 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 blah. I came here to do all of that, but I am not leaving without you knowing I made a mistake, that I I have not regretted anything except for the moment I put you on that train. And that's the that's when Bond finally, finally, after you know 15 years and five movies, he's at the point where he can say that uh, to another person. He can say that to someone he genuinely cares about. And that begins his rescue. And that's what makes No Time to Die really such a, uh, a really powerful film, is that from, from that moment, the whole third act of the movie is Bond's greatest moment because he's suddenly selfless. He's come full circle. He's admitted what he needs to admit. Uh, and the last third act of the movie is just a man being very selfless, and it, it takes him to his death. But if you notice at the end, you know, he's, he's got tears in his eyes but a smile on his face. And he's, he's content for maybe the first time in his entire life. That's huge. Well, that is the big plot twist of this film is that James Bond dies. And he's always just been replaced with a different actor. But after almost 60 years, he's... Uh, and I also said at the beginning of this podcast, it would be spoiler film, filled. So spoiler, uh, he dies and it's pretty definitive. He's got huge, you know giant uh, military grade missiles uh you know that he's that are hit hit the uh, building he's in so you know mentioning that this has been one of the longest running series of this type and like i said it's just replaced with different actors that do 007 the character itself has never died if you stay to the end of the credits which actually i didn't stay and i said to my family do you think we should stay but oh it's not a marvel movie they're not going to do anything like that but if you did stay at the end it did say that we'll be back. So what do you think it means for the series? You mentioned that Barbara Broccoli said that it will not be a woman. And I think it was a little bit of a red herring in this film that there's a character who is a woman who is 007, but definitely not James Bond. So it seems like they are going to continue the series. Where do they go from here? Yeah, the uh, the little stinger there at the end, the, uh, the, the James Bond will return uh, tagline has... It's it's been I forget the exact number of films that it's been on, but it's been on most of them, all but just a handful. Um, so it's 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 a tradition at this point to have James Bond will return at the end of your your Bond film. Uh, there's a lot of speculation about how Craig's Bond would go out, and and again, I'm I'm fine with how they did it. I thought it was good. 
critics are always talking about, well, where does the Bond series go without Bond? And the answer very simply is, well, it, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't. For whatever reason, I, I, I don't think a lot of the critics quite understand what the series is or how it's operated for 60 years. We are currently in a culture uh, largely due to the Marvel stuff that tries to connect everything. We are continuity obsessed. And I think that's it's really detrimental to creativity. Bond has always been a series that, fl- that plays fast and loose with continuity. There's a mythology, certain ground rules, but beyond that, it's a free-for-all. Uh, so, you know, I-, I wouldn't be surprised if the next Bond film, whoever is cast, doesn't even reference the Craig era. It's a new thing every time. Pierce Brosnan comes in, he doesn't acknowledge Dalton. It's, it's just what's kept the series alive for, uh, for 60 years. And going forward, the, the degree to which uh, the, the next, whoever portrays Bond next, is going to come back and reference you know, the Craig era, it's probably going to be very slim. And, and I'm glad for that. It keeps the series flexible and it ensures that the series is in some sense immortal. It can, it can go on forever, which in this day and age is really, really unique. Do you think they will do kind of an origin story? You know, where you showed the beginnings of Bond. Where was he picking up on some stuff that's, you know, Skyfall. So they cast a really young 20-something actor to for many years to, to, you know, kind of flesh out that whole kind of a prequel approach, maybe. So I wasn't going to uh, to speculate, uh, but they, they sort of do his uh, the way he becomes a double O in, in Casino Royale. But... I'll tell you what I'd love to see, and this is this is completely a personal subjective thing. If I could just you know dream for a moment, I would absolutely love to see a period piece. I would like to see, even if it's a one-off film, the producers take the series and go back to the '50s when Fleming originally wrote the novel, and to do a true-to-form Fleming Bond. I think it would be very jarring. I think it would be very unique, but I'd I'd love to see it. So it seems like you know, from what you were talking about earlier about the novels, that Fleming did have theological or philosophical concerns. Rather, you know, he had that bent rather than the movies. And so you just mentioned you'd like to see the films incorporate something from the, you know, maybe going back to his original setting. Is there anything else you'd like to see them do in terms of the books? Because the books, as you mentioned, are very different than these films for the last 60 years. To incorporate Fleming's Bond means to incorporate a broken man, and that would really strip him of the heroic status that No Time to Die just gave him. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it would be much more like what Craig was in Casino Royale, uh, or really the uh, the darkest of Sean Connery's moments as Bond. But uh, the Bond of Fleming was a very introspective, even even philosophical man, and I really would like to see that more. I would like to see more of the philosophical moments where Bond has conversations with someone about the nature of evil. I mean, that's literally the title of a chapter in Casino Royale. You don't get any more philosophical than that, the nature of evil. Where where the things that that, that cause the breakdown in, in human relationships beyond just, you know, mistrust, those sorts of things. I, I would like to see those coming out. You see snippets of this in his conversations with Mathis in Casino Royale, the film, uh, which is some of which is lifted from his conversations with Mathis in the book. Um, but it, and I understand it's it's a tightrope that you have to walk, especially in this culture, because we're not really interested in seeing Bond as a you know <laughs> philosopher. <laughs> we're interested in seeing Bond as a, a spy. Uh, but I, I would like to see some of the uh, the more theological interests that Fleming had, especially in this this Christian notion of acedia and the role that boredom plays uh, in, in the world uh, com- coming out. And to, to sort of show that No Time to Die has some of these ideas in, in, in its, its head, you, you get that scene where Bond is in Jamaica. This is after, you know, five years later, he's chilling in Jamaica. And Nomi, uh, the, the new 007, shows up to basically tell her, look, tell him, look, I'm operating in this area and you need to just stick to your own territory and let's just leave each other alone and we'll be fine. But one of the things she points out to him is, is he's kind of constructed this false little little paradise, this little bubble, she calls it. Um, and, you know, Bond, sort of his defense mechanisms to say, but, you know, I'm happy here. 
But then, of course, as soon as she leaves, he can't not dig into to the information he's got. He can't not turn around and call Felix and say, OK, you know, I'll, I'll help you. Um, so it, it's this idea that he he really is kind of bored with his existence because he's not doing anything with his life. Um, and that little slip that M reads, that line that he reads from Jack London at the end of the film after Bond has died, sort of his, his eulogy, comes directly from Fleming's obituary for Bond in You Only Live Twice, where he kind of like dies, but not really. Um, and, and the purpose of that line, what's interesting in, in the context of Fleming's novel, has everything to do with Bond's aversion to boredom and this whole concept of the sedia. Um, when you're when you're not doing something, when you have no purpose, you just sort of disintegrate into a shell of a human being, which is what all of Fleming's villains villains become. Uh, they become these shells of people who just sort of look with great disinterest on humanity and decide to play God uh, because they can. Why not? They have nothing better to do. Um, those sorts of things I would like to see brought out in the films a little more, but in this culture, you know, we're we're far from being ready for that. If you were going to show a Christian one Bond film, because you talked about earlier, you know, should Christians even interact with James Bond? Can you make a case for why this particular series is important? What I mean, what film would you show them and why would you show them that film? Especially the people who are like, well, you know, in their mind, Bond is that cliche, kind of what we talk man about town, kind of worldly yeah. man. Yeah, uh, for, for those people, and I know that I will I will offend many of the Bond purists here who love you know the Connery years, uh, but I would I would show them Skyfall. My my knee jerk reaction is to say No Time to Die, uh, but it is the ending of Craig's Bond, and there's a lot that goes into that. Skyfall is the film I would show them. Skyfall pulls psychology in in very interesting ways, it, uh, and what I mean by that is that it breaks Bond open in ways that we have never seen before. It breaks him open uh, and sort of breaks that that mystique, that shell that's around him, that's everything you're talking about. Uh, it, it makes a very good case for old-fashioned heroism, um, and it has a very complex ending. If Bond's mission in that movie is to keep him alive, he fails. Uh, it has a very complex ending. He beats the villain, but he fails his mission. And it, but it is the first time that you really see Bond's heroic potential. It takes him back to his roots. He has to grapple with all of that. Um, and it's just a very good movie. The, the film, the question the film asks, and again, this is the whole part where it becomes a little meta or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the question 50 years on uh, when Skyfall was released was, well, what significance does Bond still have? Is Bond still relevant in a modern era? That is the question that is asked in the film. Why do we need people like Bond in the world? Um, and I think the, the film, just watching the film, you, you get your answer and it presents a very compelling case for it. So Skyfall is, is the film I would show. Well, on a much lighter note and non-espionage related, I have some fun rapid fire questions for Cole for our listeners to get to know some of our authors better. And it's fall now. So are you Team Pumpkin or Team Apple? <laughs> uh pro probably probably apple yeah besides movies and theology what's something that you know well enough that you could teach other people that is a really fascinating question um besides movies and theology which is where my headspace has been for a while right um, not nothing the, pop know, culture related uh, it, uh nothing pop culture related that i could probably teach somebody to do uh i can teach someone well that doesn't count either. <laughs> this is an interesting question. Uh, I could probably teach someone the history of UFOs. That's a weird one, I know. Okay. I could do that. And what is something you can't live without? I mean, besides family and friends. Coffee. And God and Coffee. the Bible. Coffee. Okay. Coffee. That's such an easy one. Well, thanks, Cole, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Always a pleasure to be here, and thank you for having me. You've been listening to episode 259 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest was Colbert Gett, who has written an online exclusive film review of the latest James Bond film, and his review is called All the Time in the World, No Time to Die, and The End of an Era. And our subscribers can access it for free at our website, equip.org. 
If you are not already a subscriber to the Christian Research Journal, please go to equip.org to subscribe so you can access all of our exclusive online content. Thank you.